Okay, welcome to Best. If you could uh, take your seats, please. Um, we've got a really packed agenda. Um, somebody can close the doors at the back. That would really help as well, please. Thank you. Um, so, uh, welcome to uh, welcome to Best. I'm going to give two minutes for the group at the back to get settled. Manchu, do you mind, Manchu, do you mind closing the doors at the back since you're up? Manchu. Sorry, do you mind just closing, the, or somebody close the doors at the back? Thanks, Catherine. It's all right. Don't worry. It's, it's noisy out there. <laughs> all right. So um, I'm uh, Matthew Bocci. I'm one of the co-chairs. Um, Stefan is, is away at the moment, and so is Man Kamana. So I, go easy on me. I'm, I'm going to be doing this myself this time. Um, just going to go forwards. This is actually working. Yep. Here is the note well. Uh, this basically says anything you say here is covered um, by the applicable um, IETF policies and behavior policies as well, and anti harassment policies and the code of contact, conduct, as well as uh, all the other internet standards process uh, stuff. Okay, please make sure that you, um, so we have these virtual blue sheets now, so please scan, scan the, um, the QR code up there um, to join the MeetEcho um, through your phone, um, and also use this to join the, the, the mic queue. So if you want to speak at the mics, please use that to request a slot. Uh, can I ask anyone else, I'm getting a message saying that the, the audio quality is not very good. Anybody else online who's having a problem, if they can also send a message to the chat. Make sure it's, it's our end and not, uh, not at the other end. I can hear you well, Matthew, from online. Okay. Thank you, Laura. Okay, here's the agenda. Um, we have a really full agenda. Uh, so we had to push some of the, the drafts to an if time permits um, section. So we will, I'm not sure if Mahesh will be presenting because they indicated they may not want to do this. Um, but if they are around, we will, I've uploaded their slides. Um, and if we have time, we'll go through that. Uh, Ratko was one, uh, was the only person who actually um, formally pulled out. So that's, that's not on the agenda. Okay, we're going to go through a, a, an update on the, the drafts that we have. Um, we haven't published any new RFCs since the last ITF. We have four drafts in the RFC's editors, RFC editors queue. Uh, two of these, the BUM procedure updates and the um, EVPN optimized um, ingress replication draft are based on some misrefs. Um, the EVPN LSP ping draft is with the RFC editor and the 
Um, we also have an FYI here about um, an NVO3 draft that is applicable to BEST, which is the eVPN applicability draft to NVO3 um, that ties is with the RFC editor as well. Okay, so Andrew says there's one in last call and two on two on the chat. Okay, could you maybe go to the mic because I don't think people can hear if you want to say. Oh, sorry, I should have been on the mic. Um, just to note that there are also two on the telechat, one in last call, one that's busy being edited. Um, so all of those should very shortly move into RFC editor, provided there's no problems, you know, through the whole last call um, IESG process. So yeah, we have, a, we have a slide covering the IESG review stuff now. So I, I guess that's um, some of those. The ones I wanted to, to additionally point out um, on... Uh, on the, the set that's with the, the ISG and Andrew um, is the virtual Ethernet segment draft had a, a, quite a lot of comments um, and, and has been sent back for a second working group last call following a whole set of comments from, from Andrew. Um, and the SD1 usage draft um, has a security error directorate review on it, and that's saying there's quite a few comments on that saying it's not ready. Are you in the in the queue, did you put yourself in the queue? Oh. I don't see you in the queue. Never mind now, I'll, put, yeah, I'll, I'll deal with this. If you can just say your name and oh. what you want to say. I'm Owen from uh, Juniper. Okay, go ahead. So I just have a very brief comment. I have requested to put on the queue for review for the, the, the EVPN extend, extended optimized ingress replication draft. It has been there for a long time, a best draft. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we do have a very long backlog of, of drafts in, in BES. Over the years, we've, we've accumulated quite a lot of individual drafts that will then move through to working group draft status. And so there's, there's been a bit of a, it does take time to process all of these. Um, Sasha. Hi, uh, I'm Sasha Weinstein. I would like to repeat my question about the EVPN Young draft that seems to be dormant for the last five years. Are there any plans to revive it? What is... So in the Yang models, we parked a lot of the Yang models because we weren't getting a lot of progress on them and we wanted to, and we had a huge amount of protocol drafts to work through in, in, in the working group. And I think that's kind of still the case. If there are editors of these drafts who are interested in picking them up um, and doing uh, and, and progressing them, then of course we can, we can start working on those again. But it largely depends on participation. Hi. <laughs> Himanshu from Siena, and uh, Patrice, also to you. <laughs> we, two of us are doing the Yang drafts for the L2VPN and EVPN. I think it's high time we should get it out of the parking mode and, and, and make, make a progress on that. Okay. What do you think, Patrice? Yeah, that's what uh, Sasha is asking. Okay. Maybe we can, uh, yeah. All right, we'll look, we'll look for active participants who wants to help us uh, progress that. Okay. Thank you. Jeff. Jeff Haas, uh, one of the authors for the IETF BGP Yang model. We are finally to the point where that's a stable thing. It's passed through IDR working group last call. You know, it's stable-ish. Uh, so this was a dependency for a lot of various uh, VPN style models. I think at least for pieces of eVPN as well, depends whether you're talking about the service end of the model or the protocol end of the model. For the protocol end of the model, you should have enough of a stable thing to add to it. And the people that have worked on the BGP stuff are happy to help you figure out how it integrates. So you're at a point where things are moving forward. Uh, and I'll extend you to the offer that uh, we have going on later this afternoon. We'll be discussing BGP LS as an example of another protocol that's going to be getting added on. And uh, if you want to sit in on that session and figure out uh, how we start extending these models to fill all the gaps, happy to have you. Do you want to go first or is Jeffrey? <laughs> um, I, I just thought I'd 
give you a bit of an update as to where these drafts are in case it influences okay. anything else because um, I've actually got the list here. So just to let you know, um, we have the CMAC flash draft that is telechatted. You have the EVPN pref DF draft that is telechatted. You have the MVPN EVPN aggregation that is sitting finished last call, but I'm doing a last pass on it before it goes to telechat. The SD WAN document, which, as you said, has got a security, um, is actually still in last call. Um, the last call ending on the first, if we can get that sorted out before the last call ends, um, that will help. Then there are, in my evaluation queue, you have the EVPN VPWS um, cross connect draft. Um, and the IRP multicast draft or the other two best documents, I think those are still, I'm hoping to get the EVPN VPWS cross connect. It's next on my list. Um, the EVPN IRP multicast, that is taking some time. It is a very long, very complicated document, but I am working on getting that cleared. Thank you. Jeffrey. It's Jeffrey Zhang from Juniper. So the, the last uh, uh, document on this uh, screen, uh, MAP and EVP aggression label. Uh, I am working with the security director re reviewer. Um, I, I hope I can resolve that uh, by next week. Thank you. Andrew, do you want to? Uh... Oh, sorry, Ali, just because it's slightly separate, probably slightly separate topic. Okay. Uh, just a quick comment on the virtual Ethernet segment. Uh, we address uh, all the ADs comment, and uh, we added one paragraph for clarification. Uh, so we didn't change anything significant in this draft, uh, so it should be uh, easy to review once you know, working group that starts on it. Thank you. Andrew. Didn't I use a mic? Yeah. Um, I figured I'd use this microphone that way people can kind of actually see me when I'm talking to you because otherwise I kind of feel like I'm not talking to you. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about a lot of the documents concerns document quality. Um, these documents are very complex. And some of the time you're picking up, you know, grammatical errors, et cetera, and I'm not blaming people for that. There are non-native English speakers, et cetera. But it does mean that the reviews are taking a lot longer. I've had one particular document, which was not a terribly long document, where I found 87 different grammatical errors in them, and some of them were pretty consequential, making the document, you know, fairly difficult to understand. What I'm going to say is that we need to do something about the quality of the text in the documents. The implementation is, you know, the, the, the technical side of the documents is often not the problem. It's the general quality of the text. And there are a couple of ways that we can look at fixing this, but I do think that it does need to be fixed because what's going to start happening um, you know, in conversations with the other routing ADs is we're going to start pushing documents back when we get to the first couple of pages and go, you know, this clearly hasn't been reviewed enough that it is ready to be passed forward. Um, I spoke to Matthew just now, and one of the things we are looking at proposing is that we form some kind of a review team. It doesn't have to be people in this group, though, if there are people that would like to join such a team, beyond just the secretariat and the shepherd, whose job it is to actually go through those documents to look for the spelling, the grammar, the blah, 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 blah. Because if I take a document and I do take it all the way through telechat and then it ends up at the RFC editor and the RFC editor tries to fix a problem and they misread because of grammar and they fix it, it can actually change the meaning of the document. Doesn't happen often, but it has happened. Not their fault, it's a very technical document. So I think that having a group of people who are prepared to step up, step up and review those documents before working group last call to sort out the grammar and the spelling and the rest of it would certainly make documents go through the queue a lot faster, which I think is in everybody's interests. Because if you look at the agenda on this meeting, 
there are a huge number of documents and we've really got to get the document quality up a lot more than it is at the moment. So I just wanted to say that to the working group and, you know, Matthew can talk further about how we create some kind of a review team or something, but please guys, the, the quality of the text right now on the documents is just not up to scratch and it's got to be fixed. So indeed, one of the, one of the, um, one of the things I was thinking about is that there's been precedent in other working groups for having a, a working group review team uh, for drafts. Uh, and it didn't necessarily, it wasn't necessarily limited to those who are currently active in the working group. Um, so that I, I, I don't know if Laura um, recalls or can say anything about this, the, um, for example, the MPLS review team. Um, and it would be very useful, I think, to have folks who are not necessarily active on these drafts at the moment, also being able to review, review the drafts, like developers and testers specifically. Um, I have in mind if there's some things that grammatically don't make sense to them, they don't understand how to implement this based on what's in the draft, but then obviously not necessarily people who day to day participate in the working group. So let's make this as broad as we can in the community. Himanshu. So uh, are we asking, because there is a routing working group directorate review where the, uh, the chairs can ask for the review from them. So this is something in addition to that. So the directorate does a good job. Don't get me wrong. But remember something that the directorate is reviewing a lot of documents from all over the place and we are using them. But things get missed. And I think that in the case of where you've got this many documents coming out of a working group, it's probably good to have a multi-person team that is looking at these documents with a sole focus on fixing those issues. The directorate will still be there to look for other issues, but I think we need to go wider in the case of BEST because of the numbers of documents and what we've been seeing coming out of here. So this is just creating an additional, you know, helpful layer to try and speed up the queues. Hey, I'm going to try and move move forward a bit, little bit more quickly now because I'm uh, breaking my own advice of um, <laughs> not taking too long on anything. So we have a uh, a number of documents that are currently under Shepherd's review. Please watch out for, if you're an editor of those documents or an author. Uh, watch out for um, the Shepherd's reviews, uh, which will come back to you um, as soon as those are done. Uh, we have quite a lot in the queue, so it does take us some time to process these. Um, we're still waiting for implementations for the uh, EVPN Geneve draft. We held that uh, awaiting implementation. There were no implementations to care at the time, and we still have a, a, um, a rule of uh, we don't publish Trump or don't progress um, standards track documents unless you have at least one implementation in BES. Um, we have a couple of documents that had significant issues uh, getting through working group last call, um, and those are uh, both on the agenda. Um, we have a queue of them that we believe are ready for working group last call now that have been uh, worked on for some time in the working group, and the, the authors or editors have approached us um, asking for these to be progressed. And a couple of recently adopted documents, uh, the EVPN v seamless, uh, VPWS seamless draft um, and the secure VPN draft. Okay, that should say adoption call. Um, a few we believe are ready for adoption. Okay, you are. Yeah. Quick one, I, I understand the, uh, the queue is long, but uh, we have this draft uh, that talks about the uh, Service 6 uh, arguments for EVPN. We believe it's, it's almost fixing an errata in, in RFC 9252. So uh, we, we think it's worth it to expedite the working group adoption to, you know, to, so that people can have uh, awareness of the draft. Okay. Well, well, I'll talk to Stefan offline about that and we'll see what Thank we can you. do about that. I mean, I just want, don't want, I want to emphasize the fact that we are very driven by implementation here in BES um, and demonstration of implementation. And there's a lot of interoperability work that's been going on over the years with, with EVPN and so on. So it's quite important to fix any issues that are, that are seen in, in those implementations and, and, and interoperability issues that come up as, as soon as we can. Okay. 
um, one that uh, failed the adoption call. Um, I think there was not enough. So one thing we expect to see, I think, when um, when uh, when we do an adoption call on the list is a significant number of non-authors or editors of the draft saying they are interested in that work and they think it's useful and roughly the right way that the working group should go. So um, I would urge you to, if you have a draft that you want to get adopted in the working group, to socialize that as much as possible on the list and, and outside of the working group as well before coming to us and asking to be put in the adoption queue. Um, okay, we have. I'm going to skip over these. These you can. All of this is 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 um, on the data tracker. Okay, so I think it's hockey up, up next. Try and keep this to five minutes if you could, because I, I ran quite a bit on that place. Yeah. I'll, I'll do my best. So this is the uh, EVPN, IPVPN interworking draft, uh, list of others. Can you go next, please? Thank you. Uh, short agenda. So uh, a little bit of a uh, refresh of what the draft um, tries to do. Uh, changes in the latest uh, revision and next steps. Thank you. All right, so what is this about? The idea was that uh, you know you could have in your network uh, a virtual private network that spans multiple domains. Like in this example, you have CE1 and CE2. They are connected to the same layer three VPN, but their P's are actually in different domains. So you have P1 in an eVPN domain, and P2 on an IPVPN domain. So um, can I use it? If this? you want to use it, it's, it's okay. okay. Well. So the, the idea is uh, there was a, you know, the need to specify how to stitch these domains with uh, the use of service gateways, right? Gateways where you instantiate an IP verve, and then you need to specify certain procedures for PGP path selection, loop prevention, path attribute propagation, and route aggregation. One of the interesting things in this draft is the definition of a new attribute called uh, dpath, which is defined as optional transitive. And it's really a sequence of domain segments, which, uh, you know, each domain segment is a, has a length and a value. And the value is really a sequence of domains with the, the format that you have in the, on the screen. So domain ID and SAFI type. A little bit more details about this uh, dpath. So whenever you have uh, these domains and you are stitching them with uh, using, you know, service gateways, each domain will have a domain ID, like uh, the ones you have on the on the screen. So 65,001, um, 65,002, et cetera. So that is kind of the information that DPATH conveys, right? So uh, what DPATH does is to provide an end-to-end -end visibility of all the domain IDs through which a, a given route has gone. And here you have an example where P2 is advertised in a route type 5, and then that gets to the uh, service gateways. The service gateways are uh, redistributing that route in IPVPN, attaching this dpath with the information of the uh, uh, domain ID uh, of origin and also the, uh, the SAFI type. So when that gets to the adjacent uh, service gateway, uh, the service gateways will append the, uh, the latest domain ID and so on and so forth. So dpath is used in this way uh, pre pretty much to prevent loops, uh, as well as to provide end-to-end -end visibility of all the domains. So in this example, uh, let's say uh, P121 gets uh, the route I5 directly and also gets the route, the same route, uh, through IPVPN with a domain uh, dpath. Basically, it'll select the, uh, the direct one coming from P2 because it has a shorter, shorter uh, dpath. The other thing is the, uh, the gateways must not re-export a route that contains a local domain ID, right? All right, so history of this draft. Uh, initially, um, the document was originated based on the uh, consensus uh, among vendors and operators to merge a couple of drafts. The result of the merge was presented multiple times. Uh, here are the IETF. It was adopted in, uh, in 2019. We got an early allocation for the dpath attribute. 
and it has been implemented by multiple vendors. So as far as I know, uh, there are at least four implementations of this uh, uh, draft. And it has been uh, even publicly uh, proven the interoperability. Uh, so here you have a link to the EANTC test report in 2022, where you can see clearly that the path was tested. Um, so the document uh, went to last call in November 2020 and sent to IDR chairs for review. And, and here, basically, the IDR chairs uh, raised several issues. And uh, I really want to, to thank publicly uh, Sue and Jeff uh, you know, for all the time they spent on this document. So the, the main outstanding concerns after addressing some other issues um, were, the, you know, related to DPATH. And I'm quoting here uh, the ITR chairs. Basically, they were saying, DPATH changes the fundamental route selection behavior for PGP uh, that can result in inconsistent route selection and that uh, can accidentally be a applicable to internet scoped PGP routes. And we don't want to do that. So basically, because of that, in revision eight, uh, we discussed a lot among the authors. And, uh, you know, DPAT was uh, previously supported for SAFI one routes, so the routes uh, that go into the internet. And there were certainly some risks associated to it. But to be honest, we didn't have a use case for the use of DPAT in SAFI one. So the only reason why we added it in the first place, it was because it was a nice thing to, to do. But given all the risks, we decided to remove support for SAFI-1 routes uh, along with DPATH. As a result, we changed the normative language and, and you have some changes uh, that you can easily review in the diff of the document. So you, yeah, you can see all, the, uh, all these points, but for the sake of time, um, basically the other thing that we did is to, to expand the security considerations section uh, quite a bit. And we also addressed uh, John's comments on the, on the mailing list. So thank you, John, for, for all those uh, very good comments. And uh, the, the last thing is that we, well, yesterday we had a, a meeting with Jeff, and we kind of agree on the a path forward. So we, we need to add some additional text on the security consideration section. And with that, pretty much we, we think that the, uh, the document will be ready to, to progress. Of course, uh, it'll need uh, some more reviews. And of course, if the working group uh, has feedback, please uh, let us know. That's about it. Okay. Any comments from uh, particularly actually the folks in IDR that were, were reviewing this? Jeff has. Uh, so we, we do need to finish having the chairs look at it across the board. Uh, Sue, as an example, needs to spend more time looking at it. Uh, the conversation yesterday was productive. Uh, I think everything is very much on the right track. So I don't think the amount of work left to be done is all that much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. All right. A very quick update on this uh, draft, EVPN VPWS Gateway. Uh, I'll talk about a short refresh, changes in the latest revision and next steps. So what is this about? Um, it's really for EVPN VPWS services uh, where you need to cross multiple domains and even encapsulations. Again, the example uh, would be, suppose you have CE1A and CE1B, and they are attached to the same VPWS service, but their P's are in different domains with different encapsulations. Uh, typical use cases, uh, domain one is uh, SRMPLS, domain two is SRV6. So what this document is doing is, uh, one of the approaches to solve this issue is uh, to have a service gateway in between the domains, right? To, to stitch those uh, services together. And because of that, you need to specify the procedures for, you know, processing the, the AD per EVA routes on the border routers, re, uh, you know, to re-advertise the routes as well and to, to program the forwarding state. And the other thing that uh, the draft is covering is redundancy. Of course, you need uh, gateway redundancy. There are two mechanisms uh, defined. And we are bringing here the use of also DPATH with uh, these AD per EVA routes to avoid uh, loops. 
changes in the latest uh, revision. Uh, so we are clarifying the uh, selection order of the AD per EVA routes for aliasing functions. We are also clarifying some uh, aspects of the propagation of attributes uh, along with the AD per EVA routes. And we are also now uh, adding a reference to the fast reroute uh, EVPN uh, draft in the, uh, in the gateway, uh, but we, we will have to have more discussions about the, uh, among the authors about this FRR aspect. And yeah, some other minor updates. So we have implementations, um, and we really wanted to, to request working group adoption. Any questions or comments? OK, thanks. Uh, please send any review it and send any comments to the list. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, so this draft is a new draft, version 00. It's called uh, Any Cast Aliasing for Multi Homing. That is the, the list of my co authors. And uh, we're going to talk about a problem statement, uh, minor and BGP VPN extensions that we need, the solution itself, and next steps. Problem statement. So, what are we trying to, to solve here? Uh, so, we, in EVP multi homing is a critical part in, uh, uh, in, in, in the whole, uh, you know, especially in data centers, uh, all active multi homing is a, it's a, it's a critical uh, aspect. Uh, one of the procedures in EVPN all active multi homing is aliasing. Aliasing is really uh, um, all active multi homing procedure that makes sure that in the, in the example on the diagram, when you have traffic uh, from, uh, you know, tenant system one, uh, or actually the other way around from tenant system three to tenant system one, traffic can be uh, per flow load balanced, uh, irrespective of the MAC route being advertised only by one of the, the two leaves, right? Leave one or leave, uh, or leave two. That is the uh, aliasing procedures. So aliasing on, on this case on, on leaf three, uh, what it does is to create an overlay ECMP set for a given Ethernet segment, okay? So what we are seeing, uh, you know, after talking uh, to customers is that um, there are a few challenges in very large data centers. So the first challenge is the control plane scale. Uh, so we are talking here about hundreds of Ethernet segments per leave and dozens of, uh, you know, broadcast domains uh, per Ethernet segment. That translates into thousands of AD per EVA routes. And uh, as a result of that, of course, you need to advertise those routes, you need to process them, and that creates some overhead. And some chipsets also, because you need to create or and program these overlay ACMP sets, uh, that uh, also sometimes uh, creates some complexity. And also, uh, there is some inefficient forwarding uh, during a failure, mostly because of this uh, leaf spine architecture here. So because of these problems, some, uh, some people or some uh, customers, they prefer to stick to um, proprietary MC lag solutions that uh, make use of uh, any CAS VTEPs, right? So what we want to do here is to basically give an, give an answer to those customers that are seeing these, uh, these problems with a, a standard-based EVPN solution. The, uh, the example uh, or the inefficient forwarding that I was talking about uh, earlier is, is basically um, illustrated here in this diagram. The idea is uh, suppose you have a failure on the, on the link, link between leaf one and spine one, and you have traffic from TS3 to TS1. So all the in flight packets going to, uh, that are already in spine one. If you use the, uh, the existing aliasing procedures, basically uh, the traffic would need to go to leaf two, spine two, back to leaf one, okay? Whereas if you use something like an Anycast VTEP, uh, in-flight packets on spine one, they can go directly to leaf two and TS1. That, that is what I was talking about. All right, so uh, how do we solve this? Or this is the proposal. Uh, we need two uh, small uh, extensions. So the first one is a flag in the ESI label extended community. That new flag is called Anycast aliasing mode and can be uh, 
one or zero. So when you set that this bit, it means that you are working on this any cast aliasing mode. The other thing, or the other extension, is we need to en encode uh, a new AnyCast VTEP address. So this is just a loopback shared among NVEs that are attached to the same Ethernet segment. And uh, this is ver uh, as opposed to the AnyCast VTEP, which is the, the unique loopback associated to each uh, NVE, right? To each network virtualization edge device. So we are encoding this AnyCast VTEP in the BGP tunnel encapsulation attribute and the tunnel egress endpoints of TLV. Uh, and the AnyCast VTEP only goes there. It's never encoded as an NLRI next up. That's a, a key thing. And this attribute, this AnyCast VTEP address, is advertised along with the eVPN AD per ES route for the Ethernet segment. So with those two extensions, this is the way it works. So first of all, we are only modifying uh, or adding this optional procedure for aliasing, right? We are not modifying anything else, right? The, the rest of the uh, multi-homing procedures, they stay uh, as, as they are, and we are not modifying the, the way we, uh, we handle uh, bump traffic, etc. okay? And also, we are only using this in the case of the uh, egress NVEs using the same VNI or label, which is typically the case in data centers because you use uh, global VNIs, okay? Now, we define procedures for the egress NVEs and for the ingress NVEs. So in this case, in this example, the egress NVEs are leave one and leave two, ingress NVE, leave three. So what we do is on the egress NVEs, they are configured in this new mode, okay? And we allocate this AnyCast VTEP address. Now the AnyCast VTEP has to be also advertised in the underlay, in the IGP or BGP, right? And now we are suppressing the advertisement of the AD per EVI routes. So now in, in case of an uh, Ethernet segment link failure, the AnyCast VTEP is removed from the underlay. And also, as usual, the AD per ES route and the ES routes are withdrawn, okay? What do we do on the ingress MVE? So upon receiving a MAC IP route with the Ethernet segment, basically we program the MAC with the destination uh, equal Ethernet segment, which is now resolved uh, to this new AnyCast VTEP address, okay? Now in common frames, they are encapsulated using, uh, in, let's say we use uh, VXLAN, so now the outer IP destination address is the, the AnyCast VTEP, okay? And basically we forward based on the underlay ECMP set, okay? We are still using a, a mass withdraw based on the AD per ES routes. So um, we also define the multi Ethernet segment AnyCast uh, solution, right? So instead of uh, using an AnyCast per Ethernet segment, in data center, normally you have a bunch of Ethernet segments attached to the same two leaves. So in that case, um, there is no need to define multiple AnyCast VTEPs. So you can share the same AnyCast VTEP for a group of uh, NVEs sharing the same Ethernet segments. So in this case, uh, the AnyCast VTEP is removed from the underlay only if all the Ethernet segments using that address are down, okay? So now if traffic uh, for TS1 is received on, on leaf one with an IP, uh, the AnyCast VTEP and the link is down, we can apply uh, fast reroute procedures. We are also in enhancing the fast reroute procedures and based, based on this AnyCast address. That's also an important part of the, the draft. Can you uh, try and move forward? To yep. the yeah, because we only have two minutes. Okay, so, so you have the uh, procedures yeah. for the ingress and the, there are, uh, here, basically, the, you have the end of benefits, right? We are suppressing the AD per EVA routes. We, uh, the uh, unit forwarding uh, is it's really more efficient in case of failures, and we have a more efficient use of the resources. There are some caveats, uh, with, uh, cases where we don't want to use this. And, and yeah, so I really encourage you to, to read the draft because there are some other uh, aspects explained. Questions, please. Ali Sajansi, uh, I uh, rarely have a disagreement with Jorge, but this is one of it which uh, I have a serious concern and I discussed this offline with Jorge and uh, for the benefit of working group, 
uh, I'm going to go over some of it. Uh, I think uh, this draft creates more issues than solves. Okay, and it basically injects uh, one prefix, one anycast address in the baseline uh, per ESI into the underlay and creates more ECMP objects uh, for the hardware to uh, uh, deal with. Uh, we can aggregate all these. Uh, uh, we can aggregate the ECMP uh, <clears throat> for all the ESI into a single object, and uh, we can do it efficiently uh, as, you know, currently. Uh, we don't need uh, any cast addresses for that. Uh, the argument for uh, it helps in the control plane in reducing the route, uh, the number of the routes needed uh, for the Ether AD per EVI is a fraction of the route for uh, MAC IP route. MAC IP route by far is the largest number. So if you reduce it by 10%, you know, uh, that's not significant. And uh, if we try to aggregate this stuff as uh, your last slide alluded to, then you, you, uh, you will lose the benefit of the, some of the benefit you mentioned before. So, uh, I think uh, we maybe, uh, you know, uh, if uh, <clears throat> what I'm indicating is not clear, I can put together a draft to go over uh, a best uh, common practice to go over all that. Uh, but uh, I think what we have currently is very comprehensive, the all active multi-homing with a lot of flexibility and uh, uh, we can, uh, uh, if there are issues in implementation, we can, you know, these are implementation issues and fi uh, can fix this, and we can aug augment it with procedures such as FRR uh, to make uh, very uh, fast convergence and all that. All right. Okay, thank you, Ali. So, yeah, as, as you say, we, we discussed offline, and uh, I really thank your um, feedback that you already provided. Uh, so you mentioned about the uh, any Casper uh, Ethernet segment. Uh, as you can see, that that's not the case. You have a procedure to have uh, an AnyCast Vita being shared by multiple Ethernet segments, which is actually the, the common use case in data centers. You can reuse the same AnyCast Vita for multiple Ethernet segments. And the other thing that you mentioned about the number of AD per EVA routes, that is, uh, yeah, we, we believe it's an issue, but if you don't have an issue with that, of course, you, you don't need to use this extension. It's uh, not so that we are updating anything, it's right. just an optional thing. So if I'm aggregating, then what's the difference? And, and the aggregation is needed in order to re, uh, reduce the overload on the underlay on the IGP. And if I'm doing this aggregation, then what's the difference between what is proposed in here and what we currently have? Because currently we can do aggregation and currently, uh, the best uh, common practice is to do the aggregation. Yeah, but you still hear the proposal is still to use the AnyCast VTAP, right? That can solve the, uh, the inefficiency that we discussed here. Uh, but you lose that, uh, uh, once you do the aggregation, you lose that efficiency because now you cannot withdraw the AnyCast from the underlay to for your under, they rely on your underlay convergence to deliver the packet to the uh, yeah. egress PE. So we uh, we can you know if you want we can have more discussions and all that. But uh, sure, I, 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 I think I let's take this to, can we take this discussion yeah. to the list because yeah. we're sort of out of time on this one. Sammy Butro Siena, uh, actually I like the idea of any cast and yes I presented by any cast uh, yeah, very good idea. <laughs> Really, really, yeah, uh, really interesting. I know you, you liked it. <laughs> because it does change, it does change the convergence to be underlay. So, uh, which, uh, which is not an overlay convergence like what other overlay techniques are doing. Uh, but anyway, uh, the only comment I have here, other than saying the idea is great, uh, don't you need to refer to the draft where the idea originated three years ago? Sorry, uh, I missed the Don't question. Don't you need to refer to the draft where the idea originated three years ago? Originated three years ago? My draft originated that idea three years ago, right? Yeah. 
the the anycast uh, thing is is not a new idea. I mean, it has been used for a long time, and uh, no, and this using is using the anycast for ESI, man. <laughs> okay, no, you uh, we can we can discuss later when you present the the draft, Jeff. Just in your NVIDIA. So I understand where you're coming from. I've served this. However, it creates an additional layer of complexity. It took a couple of years to data center folks to actually figure out how to troubleshoot uh, uh, multi-homing issues. Your draft has zero operational considerations. It should be at least three pages section to explain people how to troubleshoot this comparison to normal multi-homing. And uh, as a note to your example, most people use a RFC 7938 ISN allocation, so you cannot go up to get down. It will be dropped. Where would you go up to go down, sorry? Uh, it was your example with inefficient uh, uh -huh. uh, forwarding. Yeah, because you're still, if, if you use a uh, unique as VTEC, that's uh, the case, right? But you cannot go back up to the spine because uh, IS is already there. Person. Right, you use same ISN on all spines, normally. Okay, we can discuss offline. Sure, but practically, think about people who operate this. Yeah, all the tooling is built on on existing practices. This is new. Okay, it's so good. if you have suggestions for the operations and troubleshooting or whatever, we can discuss. If you progress with it, yes. Okay, Alex. thanks. Hi, sorry, Alex Marista. Just a quick point. Um, the kind of drive from this is the fact that we are seeing customers not adopt this, right? Simply down the scale. And what they are adopting is an anycast model, which is proprietary. Right? And the challenge is the size of the routes. I don't think we can dismiss the EVI routes. You're talking about in a very large data center, this could be a quarter million routes. Quarter of a million routes. Quarter of a million routes, yes. From EVIs. But still, there's a quarter million routes, right? Ali, can you come to the mic if you... So, this is interesting. Quarter million routes for EVI, and I'm asking what is the number of the routes for Mac and IP? 10 million, probably. And quarter million relative to 10 million, we are trying to optimize quarter million? <laughs> so again, quarter million is still a reduction. And then a second, if you have a faster failover. Okay. So we, we can have the discussion, we can have the discussion offline. So the discussion on this, because we should really concentrate on efficiency of an order of magnitude, not 5% or 10%. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Patrice, I think you're next. Why is this not? That should be, yeah, that should work. All right, good morning, Patrice Brissette at Cisco. Um, so I'm here to present the L2 Gateway uh, Protocol draft. Um, so brief history is that this draft came out like a while back in ITF 103 and we got Many updates, many comments from um, different vendor and uh, other um, provider here. So we updated on the well, on those one like 0406 and 110. Then we got the work group adoption. Um, so we keep also updating base again on the on the feedback that we are uh, that we were that we were getting. And then we went to a work group last call that unfortunately did not pass. So. Um, so the document, I, I present like anyway, I find it very, very good. Um, it is solving like real problem that we are seeing. We are we have already two vendor uh, deploying the solution. So what I would like is really to suggest you guys to go over it one more time, right? And if you don't understand what's going on inside, please come to see me or any or any of the co-author, and we can go over with you. Uh, and explain. Um, we truly believe it's an important draft. Um, and again, it's been deployed, uh, it's been used by vendors. So um, please just take time. And if you have questions, uh, come to see us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Sasha. Uh, this is Sasha Weinstein. I have expressed my support for the draft uh, uh, in the, during the... I have been, unfortunately, the only person 
uh, in addition to the authors who has supported the draft, I would like to confirm that I and my uh, I strongly support the draft. Uh, from my point of view, it addresses an important uh, problem and provides a, a, a nice, uh, very effective solution for this problem. Uh, as I have uh, said in my last call comment, uh, we have a uh, we are one of the uh, ribbon is one of the uh, at least two vendors who have implemented this draft and i think that uh, uh, indeed uh, i call for everybody to uh, to follow the suggestions by patrice and uh, to advance this draft thank you okay thank you thank you so i think ali you're not next all right uh I guess regarding Jorge draft, now it makes sense why Sammy loves it so much. He thinks he did it first. Okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> with respect to this draft, uh, this is the, uh, we've identified uh, some issues with the 8317 uh, RFCs, which is uh, the e tree, eVPN e tree, and uh, uh, this uh, draft is addressing this, and it is done in collaboration with the uh, authors mentioned here. And uh, it is currently in the implementation process. So, uh, so let's start with the uh, three main scenarios that was mentioned in the uh, baseline RFC. You know, they uh, talk about the the E3 and the E3 uh, can be done at the PE level, like a one PE for a given uh, bridge domain. One PE is a root and another PE is a leaf. Uh, uh, other PEs are leaf or so forth, but is at the PE level. The second scenario takes the level, gra uh, level of granularity to one level lower. And it says uh, for a given bridge domain, you can have uh, leaf or root on a pair attachment circuit. Uh, so a given PE uh, can have both leaf and root attachment circuits for the same uh, broadcast domain. And then the third scenario even takes it one level further and says you can have a leaf and root indication on a pair uh, MAC address. Uh, so uh, the third one, although we don't see uh, uh, that many or we don't, you know, we haven't come across the uh, uh, requirement uh, from customer to support the third, but the one and two are becoming very prominent. Uh, and uh, this uh, draft talks about the changes and the clarifications that we did uh, for the one and two. Uh, so let's start with the clarification. Uh, in the baseline draft, uh, we talk about the uh, root and leaf uh, in context of the EVI, and to be more precise, it is in context of the bridge domain. And the bridge domain can have a one-to-one -one mapping to EVI for VLAN-based service and VLAN bundle services, but it can have uh, EVI, a BD can map to EVI plus VLAN for VLAN average services. So we made it more concise in terms of this clarification. And uh, also we changed the diagram uh, to uh, illustrate the uh, uh, E3 better by uh, having three uh, PEs as opposed to two. So now uh, we go through the main changes. You know, the uh, first change we did was to the scenario number one. And uh, as I mentioned, scenario number one is root or uh, uh, leaf uh, indication per PE. And on a pair broadcast domain basis. And uh, we had the option to use two rod target uh, to 
uh, to do that. That was a like a uh, the primary that was uh, uh, the backup option. The main option was just to use a single RT, and it turned out that the uh, two RT solution uh, has an issue and doesn't support uh, eVPN mobility, uh, and so. Uh, we got rid of the two RT option, and uh, it is not the baseline, the main option that we indicated using a single raw target. And uh, for this scenario, the ingress, uh, the uh, filtering for the non unicast route is done on the ingress as we had it in the uh, baseline RFC. And we, uh, in terms of the uh, enhancement, we said uh, for the if for the bomb traffic, uh, we have ingress replication as opposed to point to multipoint or multipoint to multipoint tunnel, then we can also improve it a little bit more and do the ingress filtering for the bomb traffic. Uh, and uh, such that the, uh, the bomb traffic doesn't get sent uh, to the, uh, uh, from leaf to the other leaf nodes. You just do the filtering on the uh, ingress leaf. And uh, uh, there are two options that are specified in the uh, draft. And uh, uh, that uh, uh, for this uh, ingress filtering. Then uh, uh, we go to uh, the options. One of the options uh, basically uses the uh, existing Taylor BGP rot import export policy. Uh, and then the second option, we are the signaling, which is more extensive. And once you do the signaling, uh, you can support scenario number two, not just uh, this uh, scenario. And it is um, more flexible. But for uh, uh, doing it with the existing BGP, just uh, confine it to the scenario one, then the existing uh, BGP uh, route import export policy is sufficient. So uh, <clears throat> changes to scenario two, which is root and leaf on a pair uh, AC. Uh, so uh, when uh, uh, we mentioned that we can, uh, from, you can start from scenario one and go to the scenario two and from, or from scenario two, you know, by uh, you can start like a, a one PE can have only the leaf ACs so that's scenario one. And then later you add a root AC to the same PE for the same broadcast domain. And it goes into the scenario two and uh, it can change later uh, as a, either result of the failure or a, a configuration uh, change. So we need to be able to, uh, if you're doing these uh, ingress filtering for the bomb traffic, uh, for the uh, ingress replication scenario, uh, it is important to be adaptive. We cannot do it via configuration, okay? That's not gonna work. And uh, that's uh, basically the main uh, text in this uh, draft to describe how we do these adaptive ingress filtering. And uh, to do these adaptive uh, ingress filtering, uh, we use the uh, IMET route. Uh, to uh, indicate uh, for a given broadcast domain whether uh, that broadcast domain has only leaf ACs or root ACs or a combination of leaf and uh, root ACs. And when you send this advertisement on the receive side, when uh, the receive PE gets it, then it can create two uh, replication lists and the one uh, that can go everywhere, and then the other one can go to all the PEs, but the PEs which are only leaf. In other words, the other replication list uh, goes to the PEs that are root or root plus leaf. And once you have that, uh, once you have these two replication lists, then you can do all these adaptive stuff very easily because when the packet comes from a root, AC, you can use your first replication list that it sends the packet to everywhere. And then if the packet comes from the uh, 
uh, leaf AC, you can use the second replication list that sends it to everywhere but the leaf nodes. So this, uh, 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 this table shows uh, when the P advertise the E3 extended community along with the IMET route, when should it set the uh, root flag and when should it send, uh, set the leaf flag? And uh, uh, it says basically, uh, if there is no root or leaf ACs, which is the baseline EVPN, you don't advertise this uh, extended community. Uh, if uh, there are only root ACs and no leaf, and still you don't advertise it because root ACs just behave as a regular EVP. Uh, root uh, PEs just behave as a regular EVPN PEs. Uh, however, once you add the leaf AC, then you set the leaf flag and then you send the VNI uh, associated with the leaf. Uh, uh, you uh, indicate that this uh, leaf indication for, is for this VNI. And uh, when both root and leaf are set, uh, same thing. And then uh, this next table uh, shows that when you use the two, uh, when, uh, between the two flood lists that you have, when you use the first one and when you use the second one. So uh, it says if the packet comes from the root, uh, which is uh, row one and three, uh, you use the first flood list, which goes everywhere. And then if the packet comes from the leaf AC, and you use the second flood list that goes to uh, all the PEs, but the leaf PEs. And uh, this way you can achieve ingress filtering for the bomb traffic, which is efficient, uh, as well as have it adaptive and not worry about uh, when a leaf comes to the service or when the failure happens or that sort of thing. So that wraps it up. I think we got uh, Sasha on the call. Yeah. Sasha, go ahead, please. Uh, just one, I looked up the, the draft and I before the meeting and I didn't find there and that was my problem with it, exactly the information about changes relative to HG17, uh, 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 which is customary in BIS uh, drafts for, for already past, uh, published RFCs. Uh, the information, my gut feeling from uh, this presentation is that there are lots of changes, but in any case, I think that in order to proceed with, the, with this draft, uh, some uh, compressed version of this presentation should be explicitly included in the text of the next revision. Uh, this will really help the readers to understand what has okay. changed and why. I, I believe this, uh, this is doable. Uh, and from my point of view, definitely worth doing. Well, that's a good suggestion. We add a section with respect to the changes uh, to make it uh, very clear what has changed since uh, uh, the baseline RFC and why we are making the changes. So good suggestion, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. okay thank thanks. You. Any other questions, comments? No, thanks. Right. Sure. Okay. Simon, you're next. Let me go on the microphone here. <laughs> yeah, it should work, yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sammy Boutros from Siena. Uh, I'm presenting this draft on behalf of the authors. So the list is there. So, sorry, I'm presenting an update on the draft, right? The draft was uh, originally presented at IETF 109 online uh, in November 2020, so almost three years ago. 
um, the draft is about uh, using SR uh, to, uh, to deliver an optimized, what we call optimized ELAN service with data plane machine learning. Um, so the idea here is that uh, uh, what the draft is proposing is maintaining the semantics of the pseudoR. However, solving uh, the basic issue with the pseudoR. So the pseudoR historically has been <clears throat> uh, the label of the pseudoR historically have been presenting two pieces of information, which is the endpoint and the subs. So uh, because of that, we had issues with scale uh, in Sudoir in general, uh, and all sorts of issues uh, in deploy deploying Sudoir in large scale networks uh, and so on, and, and control plane associated with setting up Sudoir. So all the baggage that comes with the Sudoir, uh, you know, uh, extrapolate here in terms of how much we need and so on. So what the draft is proposed, uh, what the draft proposed is splitting the information that the pseudoR present, which is the endpoint plus the service into two different labels, or with a sort terminology, two different SID. So one which we call the service SID, and one which is which presents the endpoint uh, where the pseudoR uh, is ending, the two endpoint of pseudoR. Uh, we as well propose in the draft a way of achieving functionality like active-active, because pseudoRs, for example, historically has not been doing any active-active uh, redundancy uh, or allowing any multipassing in the core of the network. It was, uh, you know, layer two hates, uh, uh, you know, active-active redundancy and, and try to block any uh, redundant pass on the network. So that draft is saying, okay, hey, I'm going to bring as well uh, to the pseudoR world the active active redundancy and i'm going to do that using what we call an anycast set uh the anycast set here is presenting uh, the access esi where we are providing on the access the multi-home right so that anycast is presenting an esi uh, and we can uh if if the endpoint is an anycast then it is presented by uh, the multiple provider edges that are attached to that multi-home site. And of course, as uh, I already explained, we improve on pseudo-R scale because by splitting the service from the endpoint, now we don't need the huge amount of control planes that uh, baggage that we have to carry to signal all those pseudo-Rs. So, so we're giving a simple example. If you have 10,000 service, uh, you know, uh, with 1,000 points, we only need to communicate the 10,000 service. So simplify the control plane greatly. Actually, we have a mechanism by which even each service in control plane can be presented by a bit to say whether that E has that service enabled or not. Uh, you know, so with one message, one control plane message, for example, you can tell the whole network what service you are active on and what service you are not. So summarize the benefit. I already mentioned some of them. Great simplification is the control plane. You know, um, uh, you know, uh, of course, a much, uh, much better scale on top of what legacy pseudoRs provide. Uh, as I mentioned, by splitting the endpoint from the service itself and presenting it on the SID list as two SIDs, right? Uh, we maintain data plane like learning, right? Uh, where it should be, uh, where it has been uh, for the last, I, I don't know how many, four decades. So maintain it uh, in the ASICs, where the data plane learning has been happening, uh, where uh, we can achieve, of course, with layer two switching, the way it was optimized over the so many decades, the fast convergence, the Mac move, uh, the, con the conversational learning, all the good things that come with data plane Mac learning. Uh, we bring the benefit of active-active multi-homing, multi-passing, even ARP suppression uh, can be achieved using this. Uh, by uh, leveraging, of course, the Anycast SID or the Anycast technique. And the good thing about the Anycast, just to make sure everyone is aware of it, is that when you use an Anycast to present an ESI, we change the convergence problem from being an overlay problem to become an underlay, right? So once your underlay converge, you don't need to converge your overlay. So there is no need to implement any overlay convergence. So it's not a problem that you need to solve it's a problem that won't exist for you to solve. 
So eliminating the problem, of course, is, uh, uh, you know, you can consider it as a solution, but, but it's, uh, you know, you, you don't have to create a problem to find a solution for it. So, so don't, you know, yeah, the saying of a solution in search of a problem here, uh, you have to create the problem first then, or, or come up with a solution then define the problem. But here we are saying a problem of overlay convergence we eliminated it. Can, so can you, can you try and get to it? Because we were kind of running I out of time. I asked for 10 minutes. I was given five, right? Yeah, but well, it's been presented a few times before. Okay, so I'm done here. So I think the last update you are saying, uh, we have an implementation prototype from Broadcom uh, for this, for many parts of this draft, thanks to Broadcom. Uh, and uh, we are going to be in the process of starting uh, to uh, try this in Providers Network. Uh, we hope that the work group uh, would be willing to adopt the draft and work with us on it, or it's fine too. You, we can wait until the solution get deployed, then uh, maybe customers or provider will be asking other vendors to contribute. So just, just uh, uh, before, before we go to the discussion, just to kind of a comment on uh, um, the scope of BESS and our charter and things is really about BGP enabled services. It's not clear to me what you're asking BESS to do with this. It's, it's a trust. BGP service. We are saying we have so a control. But it's, it, you're asking us to make some extensions to our signaling for this? Or there is yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the draft, we have a draft now that does not describe, uh, of course, the exact signaling, how are you going to signal in BGP, but we are going to have a signaling draft as well that describe, uh, that describe what we are implementing. And uh, yeah, we can extend that draft or have another draft for the signaling. Okay. All right. I uh, guess Alec, I was yeah. first in the queue, right? Yeah. Alec. Okay, so uh, Sammy, you mentioned uh, three things. Uh, uh, one is uh, by decoupling the service from the endpoints, you uh, achieve a uh, uh, very good uh, scale uh, as opposed to traditional pseudo wires. And uh, by doing that method and uh, doing the uh, learning of the MAC addresses over the core, network core, uh, uh, we can achieve simplicity, and then the, uh, simplicity was the second. And the third was uh, the Anycast, which you think is the greatest thing. So, okay, let's uh, go over each one of them, okay? Uh, with respect to the decoupling of the service from the endpoints, there is an RFC for it. And the learning over oh, the great, core... Great, yeah. The, R, the RFC is 7348 VXLAN, baseline VXLAN, written over 11 years ago. And you know what? It got a, a little bit of deploy. Uh, it, I don't frankly know any customers who, has, who are using it right now because everybody realizes the issues and everybody moved to the EDPN Actually, we have, control I have, plane. I have no religion here. If no, customers no, no, does no, it just... wants this, you know, I, I think I think just to make sure that we are not gonna be uh, spending. I guess uh, the chair here was having issues with staying more than the five minutes for me. I am. So just... we are not gonna be spending another five minutes. I am just trying minutes. to go on a record Actually, and uh, we let no the religion. working if group know. This, no, no, listen to me. No, if but why is not being mentioned? Deploy. No, we are not shouting. Okay. You are shouting to us now, right? But anyway, uh, uh, what I'm trying <laughs> to say here, what I'm trying to say here, uh, you know, we we are we don't have any religion. If customer want to deploy this and want to use it, we are gonna do it for him. We are doing what the customer wants, not what we want. No, no, that's fine, Sammy. All so, I'm so saying is. So, if you are is, saying this was not deployed, that's fine. No, 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 Sammy. Don't get me wrong. All I'm saying is we need to use the history as our teacher. Okay, we need to look at it. I didn't see any mention of 7348 in your draft. It was uh, sure. done. Actually, I, I was aware years of it. Ago. I was not okay. aware of it. I will read 7348 uh, and right. I'll refer to it, definitely. Uh, uh, and uh, then uh, maybe, uh, you know, if needed, I can write a draft to describe why we, you know, uh, why uh, the please, please do. industry moved away from that and why they didn't implement the base VXLAN. Base VXLAN was done without this any is BGP not base control. VXLAN. This no, no, is not I know. But the, in the base VXLAN, which is 7348, they did the learning over the uh, core in the data plane using the VTEP endpoint addresses, 
with the VNI. Well, you, you are talking exactly about, the same thing you that you're talking about. You are talking about VXLAN, here. RFC doing the learning based. Of course, yeah, with, uh, with VXLAN, you learn based on the source IP. Okay, that's given. So, what is the difference from uh, what you're talking in here? Here we are doing it with SR, Ali. Yeah, so the, uh, the underlay, the encapsulation, tunnel encapsulation, instead of the VXLAN, we use not SR or we use Geneva or whatever, okay? But I'm trying to and, pinpoint... And actually, why are you saying VXLAN was not deployed? VXLAN was widely deployed. The VXLAN baseline VXLAN without the EVPN control plane. Right now, all the deployment in enterprise service provider and DC is EVPN VXLAN, not VXLAN. Okay. okay. I mean, okay. you know. And, so just and one, saying VXLAN one final plane, comment. Are you saying VXLAN was data plane? My learning was not the Can you can you keep it really brief, uh, Ali? Please. I don't see it anymore. And one final comment. By removing features, I wouldn't call that simplification. Like I have a motorbike and remove the engine and make it a bike, and I call it a simplification. You know. I don't see the analogy, but that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna. If needed, I'll write the draft indicating okay, all yeah. the features we can lose. You take... <laughs> okay. That will be better, yeah. G give Fakhe a chance, please. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation, Sami. Thank you. Yeah, so just two comments. One related to what uh, Matthew uh, said, that uh, as, it is, as it is today, there is no BGP signaling whatsoever in the draft. So and it really refers to pseudo wires. So I was wondering if maybe it belongs to panels instead of best at this moment that's first comment and the second comment is you were mentioning uh, about the uh, any gas used uh, for you know per ethernet segment but really you are suppressing all the EVPN signaling here there is no you're suppressing routes type uh, one to four so there is no ethernet segment so really you are using an any cast um, right, but is address per multi-home device, not per Ethernet segment, because there is no Ethernet segment. No, but actually, let me let me ask a question: Is the Ethernet segment only limited to EVPN? Yeah, as it is today, yes. <laughs> oh, you mean nobody can say Ethernet segment if uh, is they are doing EVPN? No, then you are redefining the Ethernet segment for something else. But Ethernet segment is a seven four three two concept, as per today. So that was my comment. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks. Himanshi. Yeah, so I, I think um, we need to keep an open mind. This is not like uh, knocking the EVPN. This is a different way of doing the, uh, the VPLS uh, over the segment routing. And it's uh, taking advantage of the segment routing uh, underlay. I think some of the points that uh, Ali mentioned, let him write the draft, uh, but I think these are not valid. Uh, we are taking advantage of the Anika SAID and segment routing, and it's really a useful technology. I request that everybody go through this draft and, and see uh, what it is for technical evaluation without any blockage in the mind I, about any Yeah, okay. I think, um, yeah. Can, can we take this to the list now? Thank you. Any more? Um, should I think we clarify the BGP signal? You, I think you need to clarify, yeah, why, why this we'll, is we'll applicable do that. to BES. We'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Krishna. Sorry, it takes a. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm uh, Krishna Swami. Uh, I will be presenting this uh, uh, EVPN uh, first of uh, security on behalf of my co-authors. Can you can you keep try and keep this to five minutes? Actually, I know we gave you ten. It's just that we've things have overrun okay. a bit. Please. Sure. Uh, yes. So this is uh, presented in uh, uh, last uh, uh, IETF. Uh, there were uh, comments uh, related to. Uh, the NLRI modifications on transit routers, like uh, route reflectors. So we have addressed uh, that particular comment, and uh, you know, and uh, just for the benefit of uh, folks who have not attended the previous uh, ITF. So first off, security feature, uh, uh, you know, addresses uh, uh, today we have it for ARP, ND inspection, and IP security uh, groups. So those are only 
they are not extended for EVPNs. So as a part of this, uh, we are extending it for uh, uh, EVPN and also uh, for for multi-homing purposes. Uh, also, this this securities are not uh, uh, enabled as of today. So the new route is being introduced. Uh, we call, in the draft, it is mentioned as a DHCP snoop uh, route, which uh, basically synchronizes the DHCP database, snoop database. So this is the comparison. Uh, so it requires the least time to be, uh, 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 you know, in order for uh, it, when the host moves, then the least time is uh, a crucial one. So it, it was called as a remaining least time and uh, there, there was a logic uh, to determine that. Now in this latest version, we just call it as a least time. So we have introduced a new field uh, called a create time. This is in seconds and it's going to use the, the epoch. Uh, earlier in the previous draft, this was done locally on all BGP speakers, including the route reflector. So that was uh, a concern where we want to keep route reflectors to just reflect it and not act on any, uh, mo not modify the, the NLRI. So this also brings in a requirement of, uh, uh, you know, the network uh, timestamps to be uh, uh, used on all the devices, which is that's what today all the deployments have, uh, right? So that's, so that makes it uh, uh, easy. So this is the one additional new field uh, which we have added, the create time in seconds. So where the anchor uh, PE is going to, uh, uh, you know, insert the time when the DHCP snoop entry gets created. So this uh, time is uh, uh, been sent by the uh, the PE, which is acting as an anchor uh, PE. All right. So let's just quickly go through the this presentation. So here the host is uh, attached to the PE1 and where we are uh, enabled the DHCP snooping. So after the DHCP, the DORA exchange is complete, all right? So DHCP snoop route is getting uh, uh, originated. Uh, now, as a part of this DHCP snoop route, uh, you know, the host uh, uh, IP address and the MAC along with the least time. So we have added a new uh, field uh, called uh, create time. So which is in uh, uh, seconds. Now, once this is advertised to the RR, the RR is going to just uh, send it uh, transparently to the PE2. Now PE2, uh, uh, you know, this route gets uh, installed in the DSCP snoop uh, database. Now here it has to calculate the least time. So it checks the create time on that PE2 and uh, current time on the P2 and the create time and whatever is the difference, then uh, you know it is going to subtract that from the from the least time. I think the next example uh, will make it a bit more clear. Right. Uh, let's say the P3 joins the fabric. Uh, you know, after let's say after four hours, then the route reflector is going to send this route as is, so that way on P3 it checks the current uh, timestamp and. Uh, identifies that, oh, okay, uh, whatever the received create time and uh, the current time timestamp, so there is a difference of uh, four hours, then that it is going to subtract from the least time, the 10 hours and minus the four. So six uh, uh, hours is what it is going to start the, uh, the least time for. So with this method, uh, uh, right, so the RRs are transparently uh, sending the updates and uh, only on the VTEPs where we have the DHCP, uh, uh, you know, enabled, DHCP snoop enabled is gets uh, uh, updated. So the draft also uh, you know, talks uh, uh, you know, deeply about uh, the IRB services and multi-home services uh, and the bridge services in detail that I'm not covering it here. It has been already covered in the earlier uh, presentation. So we encourage uh, uh, you know uh, the members to provide the comments and inputs. All right. Thanks for the presentation, and thank you very much for making sure that we don't change the NLRI on the raw reflector, which was a big concern at yeah. least for me. And the only thing that I'm missing now in the draft is the interaction with uh, proxy R, proxy ND tables and, and ARP ND proxy on IRB interfaces, right? What is the interaction? So what happens if if you create a state for an, uh, an IP MAC out of the DHCP messages and, and then you get a, 
you know, different uh, information from an ARP or an enable discovery message. Uh, so if you need to discard uh, the incoming ARP messages or whatever, you know, things like, like those, those are the, the ones that are, I would really appreciate some clarification in the draft. Uh, sure, Jorge. So we will uh, address those. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll take it in the mailing list or, uh, yeah. uh, you know. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Sasha. If uh, there is an implementation for this draft. So I think the question was, are there any implementations of the draft? Yeah, I'm finished. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, my Sasha. question: If uh, what is, is is there an implementation already? Uh, is there an implementation? Yeah. Right. Uh, yes. So we are uh, working on on the implementation. Yes, we do have an implementation, but it's not released yet. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Next up was Kadaraj. Um, can you make sure that you, you sign on the blue sheet afterwards? I notice you're not. Okay. Yeah. okay. Hi, this is Kaliraj Juniper. So, welcome to the first non EVPM presentation of the day. So here we're just going to talk about BGP MPLS namespaces and actually one application of it uh, for option C label spoofing security. So we presented it first uh, in uh, 2021. Just say what the changes to the draft, a simple recap of the problem statement and describe the use case. So there are some ed editorial changes. The INA code for the AFI has been located and uh, we just added this illustration of the option C label spoofing uh, support um, and added co others. Welcome co others. So, the problem statement itself is that this provides um, basically it provides um, upstream allocation for MPLS labels using an L3 VPN like family where um, the FEC is not an IP prefix but just an MPLS label. And one of the applications of it is to improve inter AS option C solution. Uh, where we can provide better scaling because we don't have to expose all the PE loopbacks network-wide, which provides uh, quicker end-to-end -end convergence because BGP pick and egress protection like features can now work on MPLS namespace labels instead of IP prefixes and l 3 prefixes. And uh, the changes are confined to the ASBRs or the regional RRs. So legacy PEs can enjoy the benefit uh, of better scaling. And we have security against label spoofing. So that is what we are going to cover in this session, how that works. So here we have um, example option C topology, where AS1 is in a trusted JO, but uh, AS2 is in an untrusted JO. So usually option C is um, both domains are controlled by the same administrator, but because of geopolitical reasons, it may be that some of the regions are in an untrusted geo and operators want to provide better security for traffic that's coming from that uh, other other domains. So we have a typical option C scenario where ASBR 13, ASBR 14 are in the trusted geo. P11, P12 are the PEs. And here we have an example where P11 uh, has, for example, both intra AS services and inter AS services. So the red VPN is like inter AS. It has been revised to the remote but green VPN is like an intra AS service. And P12 has only intra AS services. It does not have any exposure to AS2. So here we're gonna see how do we protect the traffic from AS2 such that we only accept traffic for the PE loopbacks that have been advertised to the other AS, uh, and we only, only accept traffic for the VPNs that have been advertised to other AS. For example, if the other AS guesses VPN, uh, the label values, it's not able to inject traffic to the PEs or the VPNs inside this AS. So there are like two steps to the process. I'll just jump to the uh, slide and come back to the, so there's like a transport layer label spoofing check and service layer label spoofing check. So basically the way it works is uh, the traffic that's coming inbound is coming either directed to a directly connected interface, 
which is like on interface links, or it is coming to a loopback. So we have transport layer inter, uh, label spoofing check on the interface. So the interface that's coming from the other AS that is confined into the AS2.MPLS context. So that is the MPLS namespace that we create for the transport layer label spoof check. So basically, whatever labels that we are advertising in BGPLU, like transport uh, layer protocols, those like TL1 is, uh, is installed in AS2.MPLS. Uh, and it points to another context that is created for P to P11 labels, that is service labels. So P11 dot MPLS is the service plane uh, uh, MPLS label context where we have the labels that are advertised by P11 to the remote AS. So P11 collects the context for uh, P11 dot MPLS collects the context for P11 advertised labels and uh, the AS2 dot MPLS just has a, a UHP label that is doing a, a lookup uh, into the P11 MPLS. So this way we are able to, uh, for example, um, protect P12 from being exposed to AS2 because whatever traffic is coming in will be doing a lookup in AS2 dot MPLS, which does not have a label for P12. So it will automatically drop any traffic that the other A is trying to get to P12. But, and if there is a traffic that's coming with the AS P1 label, but it is having the green uh, VPN label, then the P11.MPLS does not have an entry for the green. So that way we are having be, being able to support both the label stack, the transport label as well as the service label. So for the transport label spoof check, actually there is no extension required because it is like a local uh, thing. And this mechanism works the same way for uh, transport labels in option C as well as service labels in option B. So service label option B scenario is already deployed. It's being used. So here the transport label is using the interface based check and then the service label is using the mechanism that is um, um, uh, using the MPLS namespace family. So one thing I missed mentioning here is in this diagram. So the way the new family that comes into play is basically that family is used to uh, mirror or install the labels that are advertised by P11 to the ASBR 13 and ASBR 14. That's like a uh, AFI SAFI 16399 and 128. And you see the RD value and the VPN label. And it has as a next hop, the PE address and the label. And the route target, it identifies the context for that PE. So this is just the way the VPN, uh, the MPLS namespace is being signaled to the ASBRs. So yeah, next steps. So we have an implementation which we are productizing and uh, we would like uh, more feedback from the draft from the working group. There may be improvements. We are already hearing some uh, feedback from our customers. So we're working on that. And um, I would request for working group adoption so that we can work together on these things to provide a better NTS option C with all these features. There are no more questions. Thank you. Any, thanks. Any questions? Thank you. Jeffrey, I think you're next. Since uh, we don't have much time, I'm going to sk skip to okay. slide, slide number two. Uh, here. Um, so a very quick uh, background the option C here. Um, the PEs exchange service routes um, through uh, route reflectors and the service label and next hops are not cha changed. Um, and then the, the uh, equal Ingress PE, when they receive the routes, they will just uh, use the LSP that is to the uh, Egress PE who advertised that route, and they will switch the traffic all the way through. Uh, with that, um, the PE's loopback addresses are exposed everywhere, um, and, and we need to establish those uh, LSPs for PEs. Um, some operators uh, may be concerned with that, and so we have this uh, idea of uh, hiding that uh, uh, that loopback addresses. Um, the idea is that uh, we do not advertise loopback addresses along with the LSP uh, that enables to reach those uh, P 
IPs, but we advertise the same information along with the service routes. And here is an example. At the top row, you can see that uh, PE1 advertised a service prefix one with service label 100. Now, the, the routes are re-advertised along the uh, uh, ASBRs instead of through the uh, route reflectors uh, that are directly connect uh, appearing with the PEs. So here, um, when ASBR1 re advertise the route to the ASBR21, and it adds a label 201, and that label 201 is bound to PE1. And it also changes the next hop to ASBR1. Now, when ASBR21 receives their route and re advertise towards the AS200, it, re it noticed that it already has two labels in the, in the, in the NRLI, so it will change the, inc uh, the received label to one to a, a locally allocated label to two, where uh, the two two is, is bound to the ASBR one comma two zero one. So this goes on until it reaches PE three. And in the meantime, PE two also advertise service prefix two with the same label 100, but it's because they are from different routers, they, they are not related to each other. Same process goes, uh, goes on until it reaches P3 or P4. Now, the tra traffic coming from P2 for service prefix one will use a label stack um, where the, uh, top, uh, the top label is to, to reach the ASBR3 and then the next label is the 204 uh, in, in the NRLI and followed by the service label. And then when ASBR3 receives the tra a packet of traffic, then it sees that, oh, the label 204, uh, I know how to forward it basically. It uh, switches to uh, um, swap the 204 to 203 and then tunnel the traffic to ASBR22. The same thing goes on. So in summary, um, if you look at those, those uh, blue labels, they are resolved from the received next hop, then they just get a package of the next ASBR or next uh, PE. The red labels um, are the first label in the received uh, multi-label NRLI. Um, that's basically the how, how it works. Uh, in the draft, we talk about the, another option of using tunnel encapsulated, uh, in, uh, encapsulation attributes instead of using multi-label. Um, so um, we, and then later on, we realized that uh, is, uh, this uh, using multi-label in the NRI is uh, actually a, a, probably a better way because uh, e, uh, the, um, the, the PEs uh, will, uh, do not need a new procedure as long as they can support multi-label in the NRI, this sh sh should just work. So, um, this is mainly to, uh, to solve the problem of uh, hiding the PE addresses. And this, um, um, and this uh, that's achieved, uh, keep the scaling property of option C where you don't have to maintain per service label uh, uh, in the uh, forwarding plane of ASBRs. Um, it does not address the uh, label spoofing check pro problem. Um, although on the egress ASBR, in this case, ASBR1, you can still do <clears throat> label spoofing <clears throat> check based on the service labels. It's just that in that, in that case, the forwarding state on ASBR1, which is the egress ASBR, goes back to the option B A style. So that's the basic idea. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It sounds like an interesting idea. Um, out of the Two options in the in the draft, so the multi-label NLRI and the uh, tunnel encapsulation attribute. I understood from your presentation that basically you guys want to focus on the multi-label NLRI and get rid of the other one. Is that correct? Right. The service label is not touched. You the the the, the first ASBR will add the, another label that is bound to the PE okay. or bound to the next hop, and then after that each ASBR will just swap that out to, to sure. its own. Yeah. No, the, uh, my, my comment is about the multi-label NLRI. Uh, that's based on RFC 8277. 
yeah. which is defined for SAFI 4 and 128, but not for EDPN, for instance, right? Um, and, and also in, in EDPN, you have some route types where you already have like a multiple label. So I wonder how that will work out. Um, I didn't pay attention to the, the uh, uh, SAFI or FI uh, restriction there. But uh, I suppose um, that could be, uh, we can, uh, maybe it can be relaxed and extended to other sapphires. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so what's the, your second comment again? No, the, the second comment is, uh, yeah, so yes, you're right. Eh? So the RFC 8277 should be uh, extended for eVPN if you wanna use this solution for eVPN. And the, uh, the comment was, in eVPN, you already have some NLRIs with multiple labels, right? Which is the case for uh, route type two. And so, uh, you know, there are certain aspects that should be clarified. Um, you're right. So that's could be, uh, that is probably a, a good reason for using uh, uh, tunnel encapsulation exactly. attributes. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Thank you. Sasha, just, just brief, please. I just wanted to comment uh, the introduction to the draft says that uh, the same concept is equally applicable to EVPN. Well, uh, option B for EVPN has its own uh, problems. Uh, I believe there is a draft uh, that discussed this, uh, these problems and so I, I but uh, the draft mentions the VPN, but doesn't say anything uh, in particular about uh, these problems where they, they are or are not relevant, if, and if they are relevant, how they could be addressed. I think that uh, if uh, applicability to VPN is claimed, I think that this should be uh, expanded, and this uh, issue and the to which extent uh, known uh, European option B uh, issues are or are not applicable, and if they are and if they are applicable, uh, how they can be resolved. Thank you. Um, I'm having a little trouble uh, uh, hearing clearly, uh, um, but you mentioned EVPN. I, I want to clarify that. Um, um, when 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 we apply this to EVPN, um, we do need more uh, more clarifications. Um, uh, even though the uh, uh, that the idea does generally apply to EVPN, but um, uh, we do need uh, more clarifications and details for EVPN. I hope I don't know if that addresses your comments or not. But we'll I'll follow up with your follow, uh, offline. Okay, thank you. Okay, Hang Shi. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Hang Shi. And I'm going to talk about IPsec over SRV6. Can, could, sorry, could you get closer to the mic, please? We can okay. hardly hear you. Yeah, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, IPsec over SRV6. Next, next slide, please. Yeah, the basic scenario is that some of our customers are in the financial industry. They can build their own backbone network and use SRV6 to orchestrate their service. But they view the, uh, the data security very importantly. Uh, normally, SRV6 domains are considered secure, even so uh, they want to use another layer of uh, security. So they use IPsec to encrypt the data end-to-end -end in case of any intrusion happens in the SRV6 backbone network. Uh, but the SR, uh, SRH needs to be outside of the encryption to do the orchestration. So this will result in the encapsulation, uh, like in the, in the right, right figure. Uh, the ESP will be put in the SRV6 
packet and the SRH is outside of the ESP. Next page, please. So actually, there are uh, some PGP extension can do that. Uh, first, uh, the terminal encapsulation, but it indicates the creation of the terminal. Uh, it's kind of not exactly what we want. And uh, there is a, a secure UVPA in the best working group defines the extension to convey the IPsec in info in a service route. But uh, this drug is only covered for the VXNAN encapsulated in the ESP. Uh, it's not, it, it doesn't cover the SRV6 case. Uh, basically, it defines two new terminal type and uh, the, it sets the encapsulation extended community to the MVO and the virtual NAN is put inside the ESP. But we want the SRH outside of the ESP. Next page, please. So we would like to propose a new terminal type. It's called uh, uh, ESP transport only payload. Uh, and uh, in, in, in this terminal encapsulation attribute, the IPsec SA, uh, probably sub TRV can be used. It, it just uh, reuse the uh, this structure defined, uh, defined in the SD1 I discovery to, uh, to pass IP, IPsec SA information. And uh, uh, to to use this new terminal type, we can add the terminal encapsulation attribute to to the VPN route, and the uh, encryption is using ESP, and then encapsulate it in into SRV6. This will result in the ESP in SRV6 packet. Next page, please. So this is just a, a zero to zero version. And uh, we would like to have more comments and discussion. For example, uh, can this be expanded beyond SRV6? For example, do we need a, a ESP in VTRANAN, that kind of thing? Or we can just merge with secure UVPN to add a third terminal encapsulation type. Any, any comments? Let's see any in the list. Okay, all right, please uh, review the draft and send comments to the list. Thank you. Thanks, Hang Shi. Right. Go on. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, hi, my name is Gian Mishra. I'm with Verizon and I am presenting this draft on behalf of co-authors. Uh, so it's two drafts that I'll be presenting. One is the IPv6 only PE design also. So, so again, can you get closer to the mic, please? I don't know about everybody else, but it's very quiet at the front. Sorry. Yes, so the two drafts, the first draft is IPv6 only PE design all SAPI, and then the second one is, the set is similar. It's an IPv4 PE design all SAPI draft. Uh, next slide. So the, uh, the IPv6 only PE design uh, has a base draft that was uh, adopted uh, in April of uh, 2021. And this is regarding testing at the BCP draft. And it's, it, the focus of that draft is, is testing three SAFIs, so Unicast SAFI, VPN, and MVPN. And then last year, I came up with a, uh, an extension of that draft, which is a new draft. And it basically extends the base, that base testing BCP draft to support all SAFI. Um, over an IP. So it's basically a single peering, V6 peering, but not just supporting the three, but extending it to support all SAFI, V4, V6, SAFI over a single V6 peer. Uh, next slide. So uh, last year as well, I, I have a IPv4 only P design, all SAFI draft. So this is as well a new draft. So since uh, the previous um, um, I, IETF, I had taken these two drafts. So this first draft is a base draft. So it's a BCP draft as well that would initially, it would, it would do testing 
as well, proof of concept testing, as we're doing with the IPv6 only feeds. I've been testing three SAPIs, Unicast SAPI, and VPN, and, um, and VPN SAPI. So, and then just as well has a standards track draft that supports all SAPI. So basically extensible to all SAPI. Uh, so these two have been combined. So now it's just a single draft all before all SAPI draft uh, providing the alternative dual stacking. So similar to the other draft, where it's a v single V6 peer uh, that carries all SAFI, both four and six SAFI, this is a V4 peer that does the same thing, that it carries both uh, V4 and V6 um, SAFIs over, sing over a single peer. Next slide. So over the last uh, few work group sessions, I have gotten a lot of feedback about combining the drafts. So I had a discussion with the chairs about taking the two new drafts, so the V4 PE design all SAFI draft and then the V6 PE design all, C draft, uh, all SAFI draft, taking both of those drafts and combining them into the current work group draft that was adopted in 2021. And, and then with that, uh, th there would be a name change and we would replace it with a new name since the current draft is V6 only, so this would be V4, V6, PE, all SAFI. So basically taking the two all SAFI. So initially we had four drafts and we're taking all of that and combining it into one draft. The, the reason for that is basically we have we had four drafts and they both had, they all had very similar nomenclature, similar design. One is a V4 peer uh, for BCP testing and a V6 for testing and then extensible to the same, same set of SAFIs. So, they are identical drafts and the same identical concept and design concept. So overall, it really made sense, simplicity, to take take uh, both of those and combining them into a single draft. So I will plan to pull the BES workgroup on mailing list uh, to gain consensus on combining the draft, and then we'll move forward with combining the drafts. Next slide. As, as far as testing, right now we've been testing the um, the IPv6 only PE design. So this does save some time instead of doing it serially. We can now test both in parallel. Next slide. And, and testing so far, we, we're, we made a lot of progress on the V6 only PE design testing. And so now we'll, we'll start with this com combining of the draft. We'll, we'll plan to um, uh, interleave and start the uh, V4 PE design set testing as well. Next slide. All right. Thank you very much, and um, I'll take this to the mail news. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thank so, you. so please look out for that discussion on the list. And uh, what we'd like to do, I think, is get a sense of um, consensus for bringing bringing the, the material from those individual drafts into the working group draft. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So now we're into the um, into the section where we'd given. Uh, folks, lots of first time, and we do have have about eight minutes left. Um, Mahesh, if you're if you're there, um, I can give you give you five minutes. Jeff, do you want to say something first? Yeah, to, <clears throat> to the previous draft. Uh, so this is how very good example how ETF does great work here. I know some vendors kind of been on off, so we really appreciate effort for the testing. Please do continue working on this. We really want to see interop, and again, Grant's spending a lot of time testing in his lab. We would really like vendors to keep participating, testing, helping us to figure out what's actually working. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Jeff. All right, I don't think that Mahesh is actually here, so I'm going to move on to um, to see you. I think I will spend about five minutes to finish my. Yeah. Could you could you get closer to the mic, please? You're you're very quiet. Um. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sue from Huawei, and uh, uh, I'm here to uh, present our draft on behalf of my co-author Fan Hong, who is from Huawei as well, and. Uh, Yisong from China Mobile and Hen from Reji Networks. So next slide, please. 
So as you can see, this is the seventh version of our, our draft. And uh, we have presented this draft since IETF 113. And uh, this draft is uh, in order to combine the advantages of hot and uh, warm root standby protection, we proposed a new method that uh, Ingress PE should be responsible for electing designated forwarder and standby uh, designated forwarder. Both this DF and standby DF will receive traffic from multicast source. And when failure happens, the traffic can be uh, switched to standby DF and uh, the leaf P will receive the traffic quickly. So we propose the MVP extensions to perform the IDF negotiation and carry the BFD attributes. And this time, um, I will just uh, sh briefly show the new method to detect the failure between the IDF and standby IDF. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so as you can see previously, we established the BFD session between the IDF and standby IDF, and we just uh, updated a new method uh, into the draft so that the PMSI tunnel can be established between the IDF and the standby IDF so that the traffic will be monitored. And when the traffic is not received on the standby IDF, then it will just uh, switch to the IDF role and uh, just uh, uh, forward the traffic to the leaf PE. So next slide, please. So um, there may be condition that when the IDF and, and the link between IDF and standby IDF are just broken and uh, there will be duplicated traffic between the ingress and ingress side, we just proposed the two solutions. The first one is to use par multiple parallel links between those two ingress PEs. And the second one is to use some PMS tunnel FR protection such as TILFA, so that um, once the link between the IDF and standby IDF are broken, the traffic will uh, only be forwarded to the leaf PE by the primary PE. So next slide, please. So I've just uh, uh, presented the modification of our draft. We have presented it since ITF 113, and we would like to call for adoption. And we have sent an email to the working group previously, but we haven't seen this draft being added into the adoption queue. So if there are, uh, if there are, is no particular reason, we would like to just uh, call for adoption again. And uh, we would like more working group reviews and comments. Thank you. Okay, any, any comments? So um, please please review the draft and, and send some any comments to the list. Okay. Uh, that was the last presentation. Um, we have a couple of minutes. Any, anybody want to say anything else? Andrew. Yeah, oh, I just wanted to say to the working group regarding earlier, please read my mail to the list and take it seriously. What I saw earlier will not be tolerated. Please, a bit of decorum in the IETF. Thanks. Yeah, just a reminder that the code of conduct is is referenced from the Notewell slide that we that we put up at the start. Okay, folks, thanks very much and see you next time. <laughs>